When we talk about financial applications, then essentially the foundation are assets, or as they're called in the blockchain context, tokens. And of course, it's no different for the DeFi space. In decentralized finance, whenever you want to interact with a decentralized exchange or a decentralized lending protocol, then you need these assets within these protocols. So I'd say it's time to give you an overview on tokenization, how tokenization has emerged, the various ways of how tokens can be implemented, and to look at the ERC-20 token standard. All right, let's get started by quickly looking at the DeFi stack. And of course, when we talk about tokenization, then we're really here on the asset layer. Uh, so you will get a, a general introduction to tokenization, where it all came from, and then we will talk about this part here specifically, so a fungible token standard, the ERC-20 token standard, which is the dominant standard for issuing these fungible tokens in the space. Now, when we talk about crypto assets in a general sense, and also when you go on one of these um, websites where you can look at the various crypto assets in existence, um, then you must be aware that there are different types and at least two of them are still relevant. Um, the, the third one or the second one to be more precise, the one in the middle you will see, um, on, is not in use that much anymore, but it's still important historically that you understand where it came from and that this essentially has been the origin of tokenization. But let's get started with the first type. And the first type are really called uh, native protocol assets. These are things like Bitcoin, like Ether, uh, and they are usually used as a as a, a block reward and uh, to pay for the transaction fees on a blockchain. So these are really the crypto assets, the native protocol assets for an existing blockchain um, that are part of this blockchain's incentivization scheme and uh, essentially are part of the blockchain itself, okay? So that's not really a token in this case, it's really a native protocol asset. Uh, in many cases, it's also referred to as a cryptocurrency, but I, I personally, I think the um, term native protocol asset for these assets like Bitcoin, like Ether is much more precise. Then let me go back a little bit in the, in the really early days of Bitcoin, people wanted to create additional assets on the Bitcoin blockchain specifically at that point in time. So they said, it's great when we have this native protocol asset in the form of Bitcoin, but what if we want to create something that tracks the um, ownership um, of something else? So that has some additional value attached. And that was the idea of so-called colored coins. Colored coins because they used certain fragments of Bitcoin, of, of coins, and essentially attached an additional value to it. Now, more technically, also for those of you who have uh, taken the Bitcoin blockchain and crypto assets class, um, what has been done is that specific UTXOs, the specific unspent transaction outputs, outputs have been uh, assigned an additional value. And of course, this meant that it will only be recognized when you have a specific, when you have a special wallet that also recognizes that standard. Otherwise, in the standard implementation, it's just used as regular Bitcoin and so on. So it had many disadvantages. It was cumbersome to use. It was mm, a little bit of a hack, one could say, the way it was implemented. But still, this was the earliest implementation of something that could be referred to as tokenization. Now, these days, color coins are not used anymore, at least not widely, um, but they are really important because it's, it's in the first step in the direction of tokenization. So historically, from a, from a blockchain history context and really to understand tokenization as a whole, you should, you should still be aware that these color coins have existed and that this probably was the earliest implementation of something you can refer to as a token. Now, these days, the way tokens are implemented is entirely through smart contracts. So what is done essentially is that smart contracts are used to create and to manage a new token class, so a new type of token, a new type of fungible tokens, and then functions allow interactions and the balances there are essentially reflected as part of the contract state. So you have these mappings, as you will see later on, um, where you have where you can basically assign a certain value of these tokens uh, to any given address to any given account, all right? And that's the standard implementation. That's the way 
how tokens are created these days. So whenever you have a type of a token, uh, so let's say the, for example, the crypto lectures coin, the CLC we will create later on, then this CLC coin is managed by one smart contract, the CLC coin smart contract, and you're gonna interact with the smart contract. And the token itself essentially is just a database on this smart contract. So there is, so there are variables, as I said, a mapping that stores um, the, the balances for each individual owner, and that's it. That's really the idea that you implement the token in that way. Now, in terms of its applications, well, many times when people talk about uh, tokenization, they talk about things like attaching real estate or fiat currency or art or certificates, shares uh, to a token, so having some real world assets. And that's of course an important application that's something, especially the private sector, especially the financial industry, seems to be extremely excited about. Um, but there is a certain challenge uh, with, with regards to that, and that's a, a counterparty issue of risk, as you will see later on. Um, whenever you have an external promise, essentially, um, then you have still to trust somebody because the blockchain itself will not enforce that external promise. What the blockchain and the smart contract, the corresponding token contract can do is they can track the ownership, but what they cannot do is force you to honor your debt to basically fulfill your promise. That's something that entirely depends on the reputation of that specific issuer. So even though that is important right here, and these are interesting use cases, uh, I wanted to show you that there are more applications than just what people usually refer to as tokenization. And uh, you get some examples. And what's really important is, as almost always, this is a non-exhaustive list. So these are really just meant to be some examples of what the token can be, of how you can use it, and to give you some motivation before we actually look into the technical concepts. So one example of a token is, for example, a governance token. That's something that's extremely important in DeFi. Um, when you have a, an upgraded protocol, when something, when, when things need to be changed, for example, in protocol, then you need some form of a governance mechanism, and in many cases, at least as of right now, this is implemented through voting rights, which are represented by a token. So when you have one of these tokens, then you can use them to vote on the future development of a protocol. Okay, that's the idea of these governance tokens. And as you can already see right here, there are no external dependencies in the sense that somebody promises you something off chain. That's not the case with a governance token. Uh, so it's something completely different. Then utility tokens. Uh, tokens that allow you to make use of a certain protocol. So for example, when you have a, a smart contract that will only give you access to certain functions if you can pay with one of these protocol tokens. Uh, so not the blockchain, the na native protocol token of the blockchain, but here really a protocol token of an existing DeFi protocol, let's say. Okay, and that would be a utility token. Now again, that's not something that requires that has any external dependencies that requires trust that some issuer um, will actually fulfill its promise. Here, depending on the implementation, it's a utility that can be used on the blockchain itself with the protocol. Then you have basket or wrapper tokens. The idea here is that you have a smart contract that locks up uh, one or several other tokens, basically takes them in astro, in custody, they are locked up, held by the smart contract. And then the smart contract issues a new token, so one of these basket or wrapper tokens, which represent partial ownership of whatever is locked on that smart contract. So you could have a, a, an A token, for example, um, that A token is locked up on one of these uh, smart contracts and then the smart contract issues a new token, let's call it B token in that case. The B token would uh, represent partial ownership of these A tokens, okay? And a common example for, for a wrapper is wrapped ETH. So to make Ether the native protocol asset of the Ethereum blockchain ERC20 compliant because the native protocol asset is not ERC20 compliant. To make it ERC20 compliant, uh, you essentially lock it up in a smart contract and then you issue an ERC20 version of Ether, basically the representation that is a claim on the underlying Ether that are locked in the smart contract. And you can do that for any number of assets and that's how these baskets are created. Then you have security tokens and that's really 
or what we talked about where is it right here so when people talk of security tokens in many cases they are really talking about these external promises promises for delivery uh, of something external to the blockchain and um, that's what usually is referred to as a as a security token in most jurisdictions then the next thing is a synthetic token synthetic tokens uh, they track value of something this can be precious metal this can be uh, uh, shares this can be pretty much anything you can think of but the idea is that you are recreating uh, an asset that tracks the value of another existing asset um, usually through the through the use of collateral so you have some crypto collateral locked up in a smart contract uh, basically to secure to give as a guarantee and then you have a mechanism that will allow you uh, to create another asset, another token that traces the value, let's say, of gold as an example, okay? That's the idea of a synthetic token, so something that synthetically replicates the value of something else that, that, that basically tries to be pegged to something else. And then you have stable coins, and uh, what's super important to understand with stable coins is that in many cases, stable coins are seen as just this hom homogenous mass uh, of one type, but there are so many different implementations on stable of stable coins, and they vary significantly. So let's start by the easiest one: off-chain collateralized stable coins. Of an off-chain collateralized stable coin, essentially, of something. Um, where somebody locks up fiat currency with a traditional financial in intermediary or with a custodian uh, exogenously, so not on the blockchain, obviously. And then they issue a token and they give you a promise that whenever you redeem one of these tokens, you will get um, one unit of this fiat currency, for example, for, for one token. And in that way, since they have this off-chain collateral, since they have the fiat currency, on their accounts, um, they make this promise, and uh, at least in theory, they can honor that promise. But of course, that's subject to trust. Of course, that requires many audits, and of course, uh, this is extremely risky because on the blockchain, you will not be able to observe whether the reserves are actually there, whether the collateral is actually there. Um, so that is a big issue, and uh, there have been many cases uh, where at least some of these issues have been challenged and uh, where it's not entirely clear whether the assets are there. And then again, even if the assets are there, there is an additional question because they must be there in a liquid form. Um, if they are there in, in, in assets which cannot be liquidated, then there could still be some bank run-like situation. Then there is a different category, on-chain collateralized. With on-chain collateralized, the idea is that you have crypto collateral locked up in a smart contract. I'm not going to say too much about that right here because we will talk about one of these examples in the lending markets um, lecture in uh, one of the next videos. But it's certainly a really innovative and interesting category and one that can be much more decentralized than what we're seeing with the off-chain collateralized uh, stable coins, which are essentially completely centralized by design. Then there is something called pure algorithmic. Now you have to be really careful. In some cases, people refer to on-chain collateralized as algorithmic. Uh, there is a difference between the two. When we talk about pure algorithmic, the idea is that there is no collateral whatsoever. So that people have the idea that they um, can just through the adjustments of, of supply essentially have the value move in a certain direction. Uh, and uh, honestly, I have not met a single economist who believes that these things will work when there is no collateral. And uh, that's including me for the very simple reason that when you create a new asset and you want to pack that asset to an already to the price of an already existing asset um, which is the idea of a stable coin uh, so you're creating something and you're saying what we're doing is we want to pack it to the us dollar you want to pack it to the euro to the swiss franc and you have no collateral whatsoever then at some point you will be tested at some point people will test you and then this is a recipe for disaster. It may work for a while, but at some point you will not be able to honor your promise. And the promise essentially is that your value is pegged 
to that other currency. And for that, if you really want to honor that, then you need some collateral in some form. Otherwise, this will not work in the long run. And then the last category, category that unfortunately is also sometimes referred to as a stable coin are rebase tokens. Rebase tokens are interesting, don't get me wrong, but there certainly are no stable coins. So what is a rebase token? The idea of a rebase token is relatively simple. The idea is that when you have a, a rebase token that should be worth one US dollar um, at all times, and for some reason it is worth two US dollars at a certain point in time, then what the protocol does is uh, it, it, it uh, adjusts the uh, uh, amounts in every single wallet accordingly. So let's say you own one token that is worth two US dollars, it should be worth one US dollar, then the protocol will adjust the token balance from one to two. So instead of having one token that is worth two US dollars, you will have two tokens that are worth one US dollar each. Of course, that doesn't change anything regarding your purchasing power. You still are subject to fluctuations in terms of purchasing power. Uh, the volatility is still there. It's just expressed in the amount, in the token amount instead of the token price. Um, but yes, you could make the argument that the token is always worth one US dollar. That being said, of course, it's just an accounting trick. It's it's not really stable in the sense that it's, you have a stable purchasing power. And in that sense, it should also not be referred to as a stable coin. But in the literature, when you look at it in some cases, these things are also mentioned and in the same regards as stable coins. And in some cases they are called stable coins. Personally, I think that's wrong. And of course, there are many different examples. So these are just some examples of what you can use these tokens for. But essentially, whenever you have an asset, whenever you want to track an asset on the blockchain, then you can use these token standards to create these assets. What's important again, and that's why it's in this red box right here, what's super important to understand is that any external promises. So whenever you have a token uh, where the issuer promises you something, promise for the delivery of fiat currency, a promise for the delivery of an ounce of gold, a promise for the delivery of, of some, some real estate, you, you name it. Whenever there is something that is not directly natively represented on the blockchain, then these tokens will be subject to the uh, issuer risk, to the uh, counterparty issuer risk. In other words, when the issuer is not willing or not able to fulfill their promise, uh, then these tokens will trade at a discount, okay? So it's subject to the reputation of the issuer, essentially. In essence, what a smart contract-based token is, it's a mapping of accounts with a token balance uh, and, of course, a set of functions. And these functions, they define the rules, they define the way in which these balances can be changed. Uh, so the way they are implemented, of course, there will be checks. So there will be a check if the uh, person who is uh, interacting with a certain function, is executing a certain function, has the necessary balances, for example, has the uh, uh, necessary permissions, as you will see later on. But essentially, that's what it is. It's a mapping that represents the account balances and then a set of functions that allow you to change these account balances in line with the rules, of course. Any smart contract that contains these elements can be interpreted as a token contract. Uh, token standards such as the ERC-20 token standard we will look at in this video or the ERC-721 standard specify interfaces and allow third-party contracts to use these tokens in a standardized way. And uh, what's important to understand is that these are just minimum requirements. So you can build on top of that, you can add additional functions, for example, but these are really just the minimum requirements um, you have to have in there uh, to make sure that your smart contract is ERC-20 compliant. A standardized function interface allows smart contracts to interact with any ERC-20 token. And that's the idea. Imagine a world where everyone would just implement their own token contract with no standards whatsoever, then whenever you have a protocol, and let's again go with the example of a decentralized exchange, this decentralized exchange would have to implement every single token uh, separately. And when you have a standard, then you just have this interface, you have the, the same functions, and then you can implement it once in a generic way, and then this decentralized exchange can uh, interact with any one of these tokens. 
types, okay? The functions that are part of the ERC20 token standard are number one, total supply. Um, total supply is a public function, a, a view function, uh, so it is only used to look up a value, it's not an actual transaction, and it returns something. What does it return? Uh, UINT 256, and of course, in this case, what is expected, uh, it's the total supply of the token contract, so how many tokens there are in total. Then you have a function called balance off that also must be part, uh, and the argument, the parameter right here is an address, underscore ono. It's a public view function. They can return something, uh, UINT 256, uh, balance. Um, so what does it return? It returns the balance of the specific address as given right here as the parameter. Then you have a, a function transfer with two arguments, two parameters. First, the two address uh, right here, and then a, a value, UINT 256. And uh, what it does also is really straightforward. Um, it essentially uh, transfers the value as specified right here to the address uh, that is specified right here from the message sender. And then it's a public function and it returns whether this transfer has been successful or not. And of course, within this function, this is just the interface you're seeing right here. Within this function, we will have the balance checks, for example, you'll have the balance adjustments and so on. And then these three functions, they must be seen in combination. Uh, they are really um, something that is usually referred to in a financial context as direct debit. So the idea that you can, if you have the permission to do so, you can deduct assets from the account of someone else. So um, for example, um, Alice gives Bob the permission to deduct assets from her account. And then Bob later on can issue a transaction to deduct these assets from Alice and for example, send them to Carl as an example. And these things are especially uh, useful when you're interacting with smart contracts. So uh, imagine if you would always have to uh, call the token contract and uh, specify already the function calls for a third party contract in the token contract, that would be extremely cumbersome, in many cases impossible. That's why it's done the other way. Um, first, you give the, the, the target contract, so the third party contract, the permission to deduct assets from your account, and then you can call the corresponding function in the third party contract, in the target contract, and this target contact contract and can then, as part of the execution, transfer from assets from your account, okay? So basically docked assets from your account as specified in the approval transaction. And what we have right here is a proof of a proof. You have the spender address. So that's the address of the person of the account you're giving uh, access to your account. And then you have the value. Um, it's a public function again. It returns something whether the approval has been successful. And in that way, you're essentially giving another account the approval for direct debit of your account. And allowance, uh, it's just, again, a, a view function here. You can check uh, for an owner address and the spender address, uh, how much is remaining uh, in terms of the allowance. So how much has been approved and still can be deducted using this uh, transfer from direct debit, essentially. And this is the function that actually makes the assets move uh, with this direct, in this direct debit form, and that's transfer from. And with transfer from, of course, you have the from address um, and you have the to address. Um, so if you go again with the example where Alice gives Bob the, the approval uh, to spend some of her tokens, uh, and then Bob later on would tr use transfer from to move some of these tokens uh, to Carl, let's say, um, then we would first see an, a, an, an approve call right here uh, from Alice um, where she specifies Bob's address as the spender and then we would see a transfer from where uh, Bob calls the function transfer from with the from address from Alice to Carl and essentially makes use of his permission to direct debit from Alice's account, okay? These are the standardized functions that must be specified, that must be implemented in any ERC-20 uh, token implementation. And then you also have some events. 
And um, when you have a standardized event set that allows front ends and off-chain applications to be developed in a more generic way, um, so for example, when you have one of these applications or aggregation uh, layer um, um, applications later on, um, then it's of course useful when they know how what, what they have to look for and when they know that the events, the logs essentially are also in a standardized way. And the two events that must be implemented are first of all the transfer event. So whenever tokens are transferred, then you have an address, an indexed address from and an indexed address to, and you have a certain value, a UINT256, that is stored as an event um, that gives you some information of what just happened. And the same with approvals, because that's just as important when you're approving something um, and there are some allowances. And here you have the address, the owner address indexed, and then you have the spender address also indexed, and you can see uh, what the allowance actually is. So um, what the approval was, how much of these tokens have been approved. So essentially what ERC20 is, it's an interface standard, it's an interface specification. What's important to understand is that it does not specify the implementation. Uh, so you're free to implement that. It just gives you the interface and the expected behavior for all these functions. And that's pretty much it, okay? And the function and events are minimum requirements, as I have said. ERC20 does not limit all the functionalities that the contract may have, so you can extend on it. And there are, in fact, many ERC20 extensions. So other uh, standards that build on the ERC20 token standard and extend it in terms of functionality. If you want to see the standard, the proposal, the original proposal, you have a link right here. Uh, there everything is described and you can have a look at the original proposal. Now, let us develop our own token right now, the Crypto Lectures coin. And uh, what we're doing is we're going to code a really, really simple ERC20 compliant token. Uh, we have a few nice to have features in there. Uh, for example, we will set the token symbol and so on. Uh, that just makes it much easier to use. But otherwise, it's pretty um, basic. And then, of course, we will have a constructor that allows you to define the key variables at contract deployment. So basically, that we can use this contract to deploy all sorts of, of tokens, essentially. Okay, that's what we're, what we're doing. Now, let's quickly look at the code. And I'm going to go through that relatively quickly because we, we will get a chance to look at it again in the exercises. Um, so the contract is called simple contract. We have the variables right here. The first thing is a mapping from address to an unsigned integer uh, for the balances. Then we have a mapping from an address to another mapping, uh, which is an address. And then we have as a result, the unsigned integer 256. And that is allowed. So here you have the allowances. So the first address, second address, because it's always a combination when we're talking about allowances. And then of course, the value that is allowed. You have the total supply, you have the name, decimals, and the symbol. This is really just what it uh, seems to be. So total supply is how many tokens there are outstanding in total. A name is just the name of the token. Decimals are the decimals that are used. So when you have uh, zero uh, decimals, then you can only move um, just uh, integers of these tokens. Um, and, and of course, with the corresponding number of decimals, you can break the token down into fractions. So that's what you're specifying right here. And the symbol is really just a token symbol, um, usually just a few letters, a few capital letters that represent this token in a short form. Then you have the events right here. First event is a transfer event. Uh, you have an address, an indexed address we call from. Uh, you have an indexed address we call to, and then the value. Uh, then you have an approval event, again, indexed owner, indexed spender. So this is whenever there is an approval, when an owner approves a, a new spender. And then you also have the value, of course. And these are really the two events we need to be compliant with the ERC20 token standard. Then the next thing we do is the constructor. In the constructor, what we have as arguments, as power parameters is right here. So in between these two brackets, uh, we first have a UINT256, which is the initial amount. So that's the initial total supply. 
Then we have a token namer setting as part of the constructor. We have the decimal units and we have the token symbol. So these are all part of the constructor. Uh, and the idea really is that you can re reuse this one smart contract and deploy it multiple times if you want to have multiple tokens. And uh, it's, it's really flexible in terms of uh, what token you're creating when you can re when you can change the initial amount, the decimal units, and of course, name and symbol. Okay, that's the idea. And then what happens in the constructor, you can see it right in between here. So then the first thing we do is uh, we uh, have the balances of the message sender and we set that to the initial amount. So whatever, ha whatever is created at the start, at deployment of this contract will be assigned to the balances of the message sender. Then we set total supply equal to the initial amount. We set the name equal to whatever has been specified in the constructor parameters as token name, decimals equal to decimal units, and symbol equal to uh, token symbol. And then we emit the tr first transfer event from the zero address. So that's essentially the token genesis. When new tokens are created, then you use the zero address as the genesis address. Uh, to the message sender. Why to the message sender? Because initially we're setting uh, the initial amount. Um, we, are, we are using the initial amount and set the balances of the message sender equal to the initial amount. Uh, so that's why, of course, also you use the message sender here in this event. And for the value, you also use the initial amount. Then we have the actual functions and um, still part of the same contract, obviously. Um, the, you have the first function, which is the transfer function. It has two arguments uh, or parameters, the two address and the value UINT256. Uh, as I said, it's public and it returns the success Boolean. And what it does is first it checks with this require statement whether the balances of the message sender right here are large or equal uh, to whatever has been specified in value. So if that is not the case, then obviously uh, you you cannot send, you cannot transfer the token. Uh, you get the error message insufficient balance. If that is okay, so if this requirement is fulfilled, then you have the balances of the message sender and you deduct the value from that balance. So minus equal, you just take whatever has been stored in there, deduct whatever is specified in underscore value. And then you have the uh, counterpart right here where you take the balances of the two address and you add whatever has been specified in the underscore value to this uh, band to the balance of the two address. Okay. And then last but not least, you emit the transfer event with message sender address to address and value and you return true um, so that we know that the transfer actually has concluded successfully. Then we have our next function. The next function is transfer from. Transfer from uh, takes the um, from address, the to address, and the value arguments right here. It also returns where that has been successful. First, we require that allowed from um, the from address to the message sender is large or equal to underscore value. If that is not the case, then the message sender does not have the permission from the from address to actually spend their funds. That's why we need this additional check right here. The next thing we're going to do is we require that the balances from the from address are equal larger to the value that has been specified. Otherwise, we say insufficient balance. That's essentially the same that we are using in the transfer uh, function. Uh, obviously, you still have to check that whether the um, account where the, the money, where the, where the tokens will be deducted from has a sufficient balance. So that's why we're doing that re right here. And then we have this check right here. If allowed from the from address um, to the message sender address is smaller than whatever is the maximum of the type UINT256. So type UINT uh, 256.max, then do something. And what are you doing? Essentially, you are deducting the value from the allowed um, mapping from the from address to the message sender. Why are you doing that? Um, let's first go with the easier case when it in, in fact is the maximum value. So when the allowance is set when you have an in, uh, when you have an approval that is set to the maximum value to this UINT 256.max, 
then it is treated as an infinite approval. Then you will not deduct anything from the allowed amount because you are expecting that when somebody uses the maximum amount that they just wanted to give an infinite approval and then you, then you skip that step, okay? But when it's below that maximum value of this type, so of the UINT256, then you interpret or the contract interprets it as a specific value that obviously must be deducted because when you give somebody the approval to spend 10 of your tokens and they spend 10 of your tokens, then you don't want them to be able to spend again uh, 10 additional tokens, okay? You just want to give this approval once and they can deduct these 10 tokens, but then they are done. And that's the difference whenever it's below the maximum value, uh, then it's an approval for a specific amount. Whereas when it is the maximum value, then this indicates that you're giving an infinite approval and that's also standardized in the ERC20 token standard. That's why you need this step, that this step right here. So the deduction of value from the allowed amount in the mapping, will only be deducted when it's below the maximum value of the UINT256 type. But what you're doing in any case is um, you take the balances of the from address, you deduct whatever um, uh, has been specified in the value, then you take the balance of the to address and you add whatever has been specified in the value. And then of course you also have to omit the transfer event with uh, the from address, the to address, and whatever has been specified in value. And last but not least, you're also returning true. So in many ways, it's similar to what we have specified in transfer. You could even reuse some of the code from transfer. We haven't done that here uh, deliberately, so just that it's easier to read, but you could actually re-employ re some of the parts of the, of the transfer uh, function. Uh, but of course, what you have to do additionally with the transfer form is make all of these allowances and, uh, and approval checks uh, to see whether somebody is actually allowed to um, direct debit another account. Okay, that's that's the basic idea. Then you have balance off. Balance off is super easy. I uh, just have an address, an owner address, and uh, then it returns the balance uh, of that owner address right here. So return balances. Uh, of owner. And then you have a proof. Uh, with a proof, that's slightly more complicated. Uh, with a proof, what we're doing is we have two arguments. First, the spender address, uh, and second, the uh, UINT256 value. Um, and of course, you can only approve something as the message sender. So that's why we don't have a from address or anything like that, because this must be done by the message sender, uh, by the actual owner of that account. So what is done? Right here, you are you have allowed off from message sender to underscore spender will be set equal to underscore value, okay? And here we are we are overriding, uh, so you're not adding something. You really are overriding when there is previously previously something um, stalled uh, on on this mapping right here. And then what they are doing is you're emitting an appro approval event. Uh, with message sender, spender, and value, and you return true. So this allows you as a message sender to give somebody essentially permission to direct debit um, your account for a specific token, okay? And when you have multiple different token types, classes, then of course you have to do that with every individual uh, smart contract for any address combination. This really just gives the other address access uh, to this specific token from your account, okay? And then you have allowance right here. And allowance, essentially what you have is an argument, uh, an owner address, and you have a spender address, uh, public view returns. What does it return? It returns remaining. Uh, and here we have it, return allowed from owner to spender. So this shows you what is remaining, essentially what the spender can still spend on behalf of the owner, all right? Here you have the exercises. Um, I mean, it's it's quite straightforward because you essentially already have the code right here. Um, what would be great is if you try to implement it just with the specification in your own way, but otherwise, if you get stuck, if you get lost, you have the code right here. You can also find it in the repo, of course, on, on, on GitHub. And what, what we expect you to do is uh, apply the learnings from the session and develop your own token contract. Then second, uh, deploy the contract on testnet. Uh, and third, try sending tokens and grant granting allowances uh, with a classmate or 
uh, on your own with two different externally owned accounts. So when you're using multiple accounts in MetaMask. Now let's have a look at Remix. All right, let's go. And the first thing we do is we create a new Solidity file. We call it simple underscore ERC 20.sol. Then as always, we need a license identifier. So we have SPDX license identifier and we go with MIT. And then we have the Bragma statement, Bragma Solidity. And uh, again, we go with version 0.8.9. And now we can start with the actual contract. So let us have the contract right here. We call the contract simple token as uh, specified on the slides. And the first thing we do is we add a section here through a comment where we say here, go to variables. So we have first variables. We start with a mapping, a mapping from an address to a UINT256. We make this mapping private and we call it balances. Then let us create another mapping. And this time we have an address to another mapping. So it's essentially a second address. And then after the second address, uh, we go to a UINT256. This is a pair of addresses with a corresponding value, uh, UNT256. Again, we make it private and we call it loud. Then next up, we have a UNT256, a public one, we call it total supply. So this is just the total supply of the token. Then we have a string, again, public, we call it name. That's the token name. Then we have a UINT8 where we say it's public again and we call it decimals. So that's for the number of decimals in the token. And then we have a string we call symbol. Again, it's public and that's it for the variables. And then the second part, we go with the events. So here we have to define the two events. The first one is the transfer event. And then the transfer event, what we're doing is first we have an indexed address from, and we have a, Again, another indexed address, we call it two. And then of course we have the UINT 256, which is the value. And that's essentially uh, from address A to address B. So from the from to the two address, we transfer a certain value. Then we have a second event, which is the approval event. That's when somebody approves uh, another address. So what do we need? First, we have an indexed address that's the owner, so whoever issues the approval. Then we have another indexed address, and that is the spender, so whoever gets the approval to spend, to be able to spend. And then of course, what we also need is a UNT256 with the value, uh, basically the allowance. All right, so here we have our two events. Then the next thing we do is the constructor. And uh, the constructor gives us some flexibility when we deploy the token, uh, where we can set some of these parameters. So let's start constructor. And uh, of course, what we do is we specify the parameters. So we have a UNT256 underscore initial amount. Then what else? Another parameter, we have the string. Don't forget to specify storage location memory and we call it underscore token name. Then we have a UINT8 parameter on the score decimal units. And then we have a, another string again, memory, which is on the score token symbol. So that's the short name essentially. And then here in the constructor body, what we are doing is first we set the balances of the message sender. So that's the, the address who deploys the contract equal to 
the initial amount. So everything that is created goes to the uh, message sender to the deployer. Then we have total supply, which is of course initially equal to the initial amount as well. And then what we also have to do is we set the name equal to the underscore token name. And here I forgot the semicolon, so I also have to add that right here, of course. And then we have the decimals, which are set equal to the underscore decimal units. All right. Last but not least, we have the symbol, which is set to underscore token symbol, which also was a parameter in the constructor. Then we have to emit the event, a transfer event. It's counterintuitive because we haven't transferred anything so far, but we emit it from the CR address because it's created. So that's essentially the Genesis address to the message sender because initially the message sender gets the entire value. And of course, for the value, we have the initial amount that is set. So that's the event we are issuing as part of the constructor already. Then number four, section four, we have the functions. The first function we're gonna implement is the transfer function. So that's just a simple transfer. Uh, we have an address two, and then of course we have a UI in T256 with the value. This is of course, again, a public function and it returns something. It returns a success indicator, which is a Boolean value and then we can proceed with the function body right here. And the first thing the function does is it checks something. So it requires that the balances of the message sender, so whoever initiates the function call is in fact sufficient. How do we uh, check that? We check if it is larger or equal to whatever has been specified in value so that person has sufficient um, sufficient holdings. Otherwise we will have the error message insufficient balance. Then the second thing is that we readjust the balance. So we take the balance of the message sender and uh, we say minus equal. So we deduct um, value from it. So we make sure that it is deducted. And then of course we will also reflect the change in the balance of the two address. So the recipient, and here it's a plus equal underscore value. That's something we're adding to the balances of the two address. Then we have to emit the event. We emit the transfer event and uh, we use, of course, the message sender address um, as a from address and the to address here are specified in the function argument and the, and the value on the score value is specified in the function argument to emit the event. Last but not least, we simply return true to indicate that the transfer was successful. Let's go with the next function. Next function is the uh, transfer from function, which is quite similar to the transfer function. It's just a slightly more complicated version. What we need is a from address, so underscore from. We also need another address, which is the underscore to address. And then of course, we again need an unsigned integer, UINT256, which is the value. This function is again public. It returns something, also the success indicator, which is a Boolean value. And in the function body, we need some additional requirements. So let us first check if the allowed amount uh, for from address to, that's the second mapping right here. So it's a mapping on a mapping, uh, the message sender is in fact larger equal to whatever has been specified in value. So does the message sender have the approval to spend whatever he, he used? Uh, as a value, otherwise print insufficient allowance. And then of course, we also need the original requirement from the transfer func function, where we check the balances of the from address. And here we not, do not use the message sender because the value will be deducted from the from address. We check if it's larger equal to whatever has been specified in the underscore value right here. And otherwise we say insufficient balance.
All right. So then we need an additional check. We say if allowed for the from address to the message sender address. So it's again, this double mapping is lower than the maximum amount of the type. So type UNT256.max. Then we know it's not an infinite approval as stated during the lecture. When it's not an infinite approval, then what you're doing is you're taking the allowed amount again um, from the underscore from address to the message sender address and you're going to deduct so minus equal underscore value all right and what you're doing in any case is you take the balances of the from address so not from the message not of the message sender and you deduct the value and what you're also doing is of course you take the balances of the two address and you add to the value so plus equal plus equal underscore value here we go then you emit an event again it's just a transfer event so there is no transfer from event or anything like that you're just indicating that you're transferring something and it's from to and underscore value in this case okay that's what we're using last but not least again we return true to indicate that the transfer from function was successfully that we successfully transferred something so let's go to the next function. The next function, what do we have? We have the balance of function. That's a simple one. We just have an address. Uh, we call underscore owner. And this is a public view function that returns something. What does it return? It returns a UINT256 and we call it balance and here we go that's the only thing it does return balances of the underscore owner so to check the balance of that account and that's it then the next function we call proof that's the way you set the approval of course here we need a an address that is the spender so you can give somebody the approval and then you need a, a certain value so we need the unt 256 with underscore value right here this is again a public function it returns whether it was successful so we have boolean success and in the function body what it does it takes allowed for message sender to underscore spender that's this double mapping again and it sets it equal to underscore value so whatever has been specified and it, uh, again it's overriding so it's not taking into account any previous uh, allowances then we emit the approval event and uh, we use message sender and of course the spender, underscore spender, and of course underscore value to emit that event. We need again the success indicator, so we return true when that actually worked. Then we need another function. We need a function to request the allowances. Here we need two addresses as arguments, so first the owner, address and second the spender address uh, so that we know for that combination uh, essentially what's left it's public it's a view function it returns something what does it return well it's a uint 256 again and uh, we call it remaining and the function body is super simple we simply have a return statement return allowed for owner so underscore owner of course using it from the argument to underscore spender right here and with that we should be ready to compile the contract let me try that so let's go to the compilation tab make sure that we have the correct compiler version 
uh, although it should work also with 0810. Compile it and here we go, no errors, so it compiled successfully. This allows us to deploy our token contract. We switch to Injected Web 3. Here we are in Robston. That's the account we're always using. And for the deployment, of course, we need the parameters for the constructor. So here we go with 1 million tokens, but we add eight additional zeros because we have eight decimal units. We call it Crypto Lectures coin and as the token symbol we go with CLC and then we deploy it. There we go. Let me confirm that and then quickly check on the block explorer oh, and it looks like we already have the confirmation. Let's check it. It's indexing and here yes there is a success. So we have deployed the contract. You can see it right here. Now I have quickly refreshed as you can see and then Etherscan already recognizes it as a token contract. You can see that there are eight decimal places. You can see the 1 million CLC. Here you have the holder table and uh, as expected, the entire 1 million are with our account one. Now let me actually copy that address right here and check uh, the deployed contract down here where we have the balance off function. So I'm pasting it and then click on balance off. And you can also see right here, that's the uh, 1 million plus these eight additional zeros. Uh, decimals eight, that's the name right here. That's the symbol. And then again, the total supply, we also have this 1 million plus the eight additional zeros for the decimals, because that's not reflected here in Remix. Now, let me quickly switch to account two, copy the address, and then we use it as a two address right here for the transfer function. We are going to send 100 tokens with an additional eight zeros. And then we quickly have to switch back to account one because account one will issue the transfer. Obviously it's transferring from account one. That's what we're doing right here. And you can see 100 CLC, which get transferred. We confirm that. And uh, again, we quickly check on the block explorer. Then we have to wait for the confirmation. And after a while, here we go, we have the success. So you can see right here from address to address 100 crypto lectures coins. Uh, you can also see it right here, transfer function call with the respective arguments. And when we go to the holder table again on the token contract, you can see that it's reflected here that there are two addresses. On the transfer tab, you can also see it. We have a transfer with the respective quantity. Now, of course, the balance update will also be reflected when you check it in Remix right here. Also, when you check it for account two, of course, copy it, paste it right here, balance off, you can see these are the 100 tokens plus the additional eight zeros. But let's try something else actually right now. Um, what we're doing is we're copying account two again. We're going back to account one. And now we're trying to set up a transfer from. And of course, to set up a transfer from, we need to give a, an approve, approval and call the approve function. So the spender is account two in this case. Uh, the value we are setting would be 10,000. Uh, plus an additional eight zeros. That's the proof we're setting. Um, and this is from account one. So account one calls the approve function with account two as the spender. Let me quickly check that right here. So again, we are waiting for the confirmation. And then after a while, we hopefully get the confirmation. And here we go, that's the success. And you can see right here that we call the approve function and these are the function arguments. So let us quickly check that. Let me take account two and look in the allowances. So we have there we go, account two. Uh, we have account two as a spender, and then we go back to 
account one to copy the address of account one right here and we check the allowance and you can see here the allowance is reflected so it looks like this has actually worked now we can go with the transfer from and for the transfer from the first we do is we set the from address which is account one of course then we use account three in this case the address of account three uh, as the two address and we will switch back to account two who is going to call the function so call the transfer from because account two has the allowance and what we're doing is we will transfer 1000 tokens so 1000 followed by an additional eight zeros i'm going to do that and again we're going to jump to etherscan to the block explorer and check the pending transaction check whether it is executed and what we should see is that uh, account two uses some of the allowance uh, it got from account one to move funds to account three here we have the success you can see it right here 1000 crypto lectures tokens from account one to account three and the transaction got sent from account two so let's go to the token contract here you see that there is a transfer from for 1000 tokens and here you have the balance which is reflected the account 2 remains unchanged it still has 100 but we have an additional 1000 tokens that got deducted from account 1 and uh, got moved to account 3 so now we can switch quickly to account 3 copy the address and once again where is it uh, here it is once again insert the address so address of account three and you can see right here these are the 1000 tokens again plus the additional eight zeros let's check the allowance once again you can see that it has been deducted so the allowance for account two to use some of the funds of account one uh, has decreased all right that's it i hope you had fun creating and playing around with your own tokens and uh, you got some good insights into the ERC-20 token standard. With that, stay curious. See you soon.